you you recently had a had a stupid a stupid fall and you tore open your jeans. Yeah, it's not even the first time I've done it. To be honest, I've, I've torn open my jeans so many times. I don't even know. Like, I think jeans, the quality has just deteriorate, deteriorated recently. I don't know if that's a, something that's intentional or whether like maybe I'm too active. I think it's just uh, cheaper because if you think about it, like the reason that jeans came into vogue is that they were workman pants. But also, I have a pair of jeans and I didn't buy them all torn up. They're completely torn up. You mean like they've like, did you buy them torn up? Because no, I know there was a yeah. trend back in the 2000s where you had to have like this huge gaping hole in your knee. And actually in, in England, there's quite a few people who haven't let them go of that trend where there's basically like people walking around with these huge, like barely, barely jeans, I call them. It's like, yeah, they're even, very punk. Like, yeah, very punk. It's like, yeah, you, you, you've got yourself locked into the, into the 2000s. Yeah, so I had a fall and basically it was, yeah, so on the way back, so I was re recently down in Cape Town for whatever reasons. I, I decided that I would treat myself on the way down because it's quite a horrendous flight to go from London to Cape Town. Also, that like 16 could, hours? It's about 11, 11 hours. Okay. Uh, 11, 11 hours, but that's not taking into account all of the faff that you have to do to get on the plane. But I, I'm, I'm trying to, so I've, I've, joined, I've recent, recently joined like the Avios Club or what is it called? The Ex Avios Experience or the British Sky Miles or whatever. And so I've got this credit card and this gives me Avios points. So what that means is that I'm kind of locked into one or two carriers. I was about to jump to the next level. So what I needed to do is get a certain number of points. But if you go with economy from British Airways from London to Cape Town, it only gives you a few points, right? Because if you go for the really basic economy class, you get like barely any points. So the way I calculated it is I would take a more upper class flight, which in my case is premium economy, because now they've somehow divided these two economy classes into more tiers. I would take the premium economy down. So I'd have quite a nice flight. And then what I'd do is to counteract that, I would go via Qatar Airways, which is a partner, on the way back. So Qatar, Qatar being going via Doha, Cape Town to Doha, Doha to, to London. On the way down, it was really nice, actually. And I told like pretty much anyone I met over the weekend, like it's, it's basically what I remember in terms of traveling when I was a kid. When you used to travel as a kid, like you used to get into the economy class, you would sit down, they would give you a nice hot, hot towel, maybe like a little glass of water. Everyone would get that in the economy class. and it really was a really nice experience. You also had enough room. Being a kid, you obviously have more room than being an ad adult. But yeah, you're also a tall room. adult. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't there wasn't like a, you know, when you bump elbows, so you oh, actually had that. had enough space to have your own elbow space, and there was like a little place where you could put your glass. It was really comfortable going down. They actually had metal, metal cutlery. So what I didn't realize is, you know, when they when the plane takes off and they like the air hostess comes through and just like sh shuts that curtain. The reason they shut that curtain is because there's so much nice things going on in that class and they <laughs> want people to think about what's going on in that class. So what we got is we got like, there's a completely, diff completely different uh, menu on offer, which was, I think I had like roast lamb or something like that, which was really like high end, really great experience, like metal cutlery actual glasses like not just like plastic cups that you have to put in actual glasses so i had like a really nice trip down actually it made me think like now now i'm thinking like what what is business class have to offer because if that's like the sort of increase tell me tell me more about that but i actually recently watched a little business insider documentary where this person oh. went and took coach economy comfort then business class then first class and well the the each step is dramatic yeah. So I, having had this nice experience coming down, uh, to counteract the cost because overall the package would have been like way too, way too expensive. And so to counteract the cost, I was decided I was going back via Qatar. So first thing I had to arrive at the airport around about four or 5 PM, which for anyone who knows Cape town, that means, and coming from Somerset West means there's traffic getting to the airport. I had to, you know, sit in a bit of traffic. 
And my poor brother who dropped me off probably had to have more traffic going back home. I get into the airport, I get on the plane and I relatively easy. South Africa is one of the best places to go through an airport because there's not all this riffraff. I mean, there's like just one machine. You just put it through. You don't have to take your laptops out. You don't have to show them water bottles or anything like that. And I just went through completely straight, sat in the lounge, but you know, about an hour later, I was on the plane and we got go off. So from Cape Town to Doha is about nine and a half hours. So it was kind of like overnight. I arrive in Doha really early in the morning. Then I had to take another plane from Doha to, to London. The thing is, I end up sitting next to this a group of like small family, small family, like two, the mom and dad. And I think the daughter was on the far left side. In the middle were like four of their kids. And these were like the most brattiest kids that I could ever see because they were like demanding the hostess to like, you know, change their food. And like, they were being really obnoxious and, you know, they were just kind of making a lot of rackets. And then they were like, you know, the one kid, like basically unclipped his seatbelt right at the beginning and just had the seatbelt like hanging on the side. So every time the, the air hostess came past, it would clip the, the trolley. So she had to like quickly move it out of the way. So it was really like. I was obviously aggravated by this because uh, we're irritated by this because being like somewhat British. So anyway, I get, get that flight out of the way. That's like another nine hours from Doha to London. I get to London and there's a train strike, which means that none of the underground was working. So I couldn't get from London Heathrow all the way to where I live in Clerkenwell. And for those of you that don't know, London is like, like London Heathrow is quite a lo long distance away from London itself. So I was like, okay, I've done dealt with this before. Like I can just either find a bus. There weren't any buses that were going that way, or it would have taken about four hours to get from, from the, the airport to where I wanted to go. I decided to take an Uber, which was about 45 pounds into the center of London. And also it would take about an hour to drive from London Heathrow all the way through into, into the city to kind of make it easier for the driver. And also, so I didn't have to sit in silence with this guy for more than I needed to. I decided I would take the Uber to Waterloo and then I'll just get the bus from Waterloo to, to where I, was, where I wanted to go in Clarkenwell. I get to Waterloo after an hour of like complete silence with this other guy, <laughs> with this Uber driver. <laughs> I wait, I start and I sit next to the bus and it's freezing cold now. It's about like three or four degrees. I've got my big blue backpack on the back. I've got my other bag on the front and I'm just waiting for this bus. And then I wait and I wait and the other bus has come through and I'm still waiting for the 243 and it doesn't come. And only about 45 minutes does the first 243 come through. Everyone tries to pile in. I managed to get on and that bus trip took about another half an hour to get to where I needed to go. But at this point, I'm so tired because I've just had this long flight. It's, I didn't get much sleep on the plane. It's about 12 or one o'clock in the afternoon. I get to my bus stop. I'm walking to my home, just about to get to my front door. I'm about 200 meters away from my door and I trip, I fall, I raise my knee, I rip open my pants and everyone around me looks to, to, in shock and horror that I've sort of fallen with all my bags and stuff and all comes over. I'm not in any, in any mood to do anything about it. So I just get all my stuff up and I just like walk straight off. Like nothing happened. And my knees obviously bleeding. I get back and then I get, get ready to have a shower. I check for my scarf because I usually hang up my scarf when I get in and realize that someone along the way in that journey has stolen my scarf. So I had to check in my bag. So probably in Cape town could have been Doha. Someone has taken my scarf. What's it's even worse, Cape town. <laughs> what's even worse is that someone's shoved a belt into one of the side pockets of my, of my bag, which I don't know if that's how they. It's an exchange. It's an exchange is they, they take, they take the scarf and they put the belt. I think so. I think maybe it's like the weight. Maybe they've got like a scale so they can take one thing off and put the other thing. Anyway, I find out that my thing's been lost. My, I've got a grazed knee. I'm really tired. I managed to shower and I, and I basically go to bed like immediately afterwards. But what it just highlights is the art of traveling 
the act of traveling, especially long distances, is a bit of a schlep. Well, uh, let, me, really, uh, let me roll this <laughs> in over there and then we can get into the nuts and bolts. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Herman and Jason Spin the Yarn. And today we're talking about the miracle of flight and how incredible it is that we can get from one side of the world to the other with nothing more than a grazed knee. I think it's a lot more than that because it's not just, it's, it's, it's become such a, a terrible experience. I don't know how, it, you know, when I, when, when I was a kid, I was always fascinated with the airport because I've got like quite a sort of structured mind. So I really liked the process of it. I liked, you know, getting there, all of this, these different machinery, everything's kind of automated. So it was really cool that your bag just disappeared and somehow ended up on the other side. But now whenever I think about flying, I just think about how dreary it's going to be, how cramped I'm going to be, who I'm going to sit next to, how bad the food is going to be. And just, I don't look forward to it at all. And almost to an extent that I try and avoid travel by plane whenever I can. Well, so I don't know what your, your worst experience on a plane has been. Oh, I've, I've had, I've had some pretty bad ones. Like I've gotten through security before. And then the plane has been completely canceled and sort of the runabout trying to organize another trip to get me to a connecting flight in time. And this was on the way back from, from Denver to Cape Town and it needed to catch a connecting flight in New York or Chicago or something. But the, like our grandparents' generation we're the first real generation to experience commercial air travel. And I think because of that, they had a lot more respect for it and they, they, they actually appreciated it for what it is. And as the title of this episode suggests, it is an absolute miracle that you can get from Cape Town to London in 11 hours, as opposed to taking a month long sailing trip around West Africa down the down all the way to to cape cape point and even even something like if you were the americas over you know 200 years ago and you wanted to get from the east coast to the west coast is you'd have those big ox wagon journeys crossing the crossing the great plains and a lot of people wouldn't actually make it across it was a treacherous months long journey that, you know, you, there's dysentery and there's wild animals and everything. And, you know, like 90% of you get there, but 10% of you are lost I mean, along the way. Which, I mean, there's, I think there's a lot of parallels to fly today. <laughs> but I think there's, there's pretty much the same. But uh, as like, we were born into a much more mature airline industry where we kind of take it for granted. We take for granted the fact that Traveling to the other side of the world is relatively cheap. Like if you are in the middle class, you can afford to fly to the other, to the other side of the world, which is, which is crazy. I mean, I've got a flight booked to Spain in May and it like, it's expensive, but it is still affordable and it's something that I do appreciate, but I also don't look forward to the act of actually getting to the airport getting all my stuff through security, making sure I've got the right documents, and then sitting on that airplane for, for 11, 12 hours. Now, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, re- I watched that documentary about the different, the different classes of, of airline or of seats in the airline. And you've got your, your economy, your, your castle in the back. And then you've got your economy comfort, which is what you had. And then as soon as you get to business class, it starts getting real fancy where you have access to like really nice food. Your, your seat actually folds into a bed. So it doesn't just lie back. It actually, they, the air hostess will come and actually modify it into a bed when it's time to sleep. And you can stretch out because there's a little cubby where you can put your feet in. And you also have a little window that you can close between you and the person next to you and you're not bumping bumping shoulders on the armrest and then it gets absolutely wild when you get to first class where it's like a mini five-star hotel in the sky you've got your own room you've got your own recliner couch and a bed 
and you have like a media center that you can chill in your couch and watch your media center. And then that swivels over to a table where they come and they serve you like what is considered, you know, fancy, fancy airline food. And you get your champagne and your wines. And so it's a, it's an overall really good experience. It's so you're like really traveling in luxury. But what I find interesting about that is that, and it's something that I am very grateful for, traveling in economy is not profitable to the airlines at all. It's, it's actually considered to be a lost leader. And the more premium tiers actually subsidize those people who are, who are filling up the back of the airplane. So I actually want to tell people that like traveling in business class is absolutely incredible. It's the only way to travel. And it also makes you a good person because the more people who travel business class, the cheaper the flight actually becomes. And we actually see this with, with flights. If they don't manage to fill up business class, the actual economy seats become more expensive because per, per square meter, these premium, these premium classes actually make significantly more money. It's actually quite amazing that it's almost like double just to get into the next level. Like, so British Airways, for instance, has, I think, four tiers. So they've got like the first class, they've got business, and they've got premium economy and economy. Qatar, on the other hand, just has economy, business, and first. But like, if you look at the first class tickets, it's like astronomical. But I guess if you're looking at what actually goes into a normal flight is that you have quite a lot of fuel that needs to be bought. You've got quite a lot of food that needs to be prepared. You've got like the staff, which are probably being paid per hour. So it's not exactly a cheap endeavor. And especially now with like raising, like rising oil prices, it, it is quite an expensive thing to do. And to make it worse, there's also like this whole anti-flying movement where they you know, don't want people to fly. And if all of the companies are doing work from home anyway and Zooming, then it does kind of rake up the price. Well, actually, so, what, what rakes up the price a lot more during, due to the pandemic, wasn't necessarily people flying less. It's that people flew dramatically less during the pandemic, but then everyone felt like flying again afterwards. But there's two things is that a lot of airlines actually, in the airplanes that they fly, they actually are on lease from another company. So they gave up those leases. And then secondly, a whole bunch of commercial pilots retired during the pandemic. They just decided this is a good time to do an early retirement. And it takes a long time to train up flight stuff, right? It's not like, a, you know, you do a quick how to fly a 737 boot camp and get that out in four months. No, no, you go through, you know, many years of flight training and you have to get in all those hours and, and so there's actually a shortage on, on, on pilots in, in the entire world at the moment. And it'll be a while before that gets rectified because of the time it takes to, to train them. So we actually have a supply shortage at the moment of flights. And so the demand is actually fairly high. And that's why we've got rising costs right now. And then secondly, the, those planes that the leases were given up on, it, it just adds to that supply shortage. Yeah. I think it's also like, it, it, like, if you think about all the different, you know, f the flying industry is a number of different actors and components, right? So you've got like airports, you've got the planes, you've got like the catering companies. The thing is, if you think of a business kind of perspective, all those companies, first of all, probably took quite a lot, quite a huge loss during the pandemic. So what they're doing is they need to build up that sort of profit margin again. again. Yeah. So it takes, it's, it, you know, they always talk about, it takes really long for things to drop, but I mean, really quick for things to drop and really long for things to recover, similar to the stock market as well. But all this kind of businesses wanting to make sure that they're profitable using, you know, past analysis to predict how much they need in terms of capacity, because the whole industry has this kind of lag, right? So when something happens, it takes a while for them to react to it. 
And especially when it comes to, as you're saying, hiring people, like getting people on board, you need to make sure that you have that baseline capacity to cover the costs of, you know, expansion. Mm. It's not like this is just saying that tomorrow we can just hire loads of people. Actually, in the, in the UK, I think shortly after the pandemic, there was this whole thing about no staff, not enough staff in the airport. So like Stansted and stuff was like ground to halt because everyone wants to go on holiday, but there wasn't enough actual staff in the airport to make sure things moved smoothly. And that was again, because for that company, they didn't, they knew that there was going to be like holiday season, but they don't have like real time data of how many people are booking a flight like in next week. And even if they do, to hire someone within a week's time is, is a really like huge undertaking, right? It's, it's not something you can just spin up. And I think the same thing applies to things like, like hotels and, and restaurants. I think there's been kind of like a lot of people that have moved out of the industry or a lot of places have closed down. And now as people are more diving into like going out, going on holiday, going to restaurants, there's not enough supply. And it takes time for people to think, oh, I'm going to start a restaurant. I'm going to, you know, open up a holiday resort to do some, something that, and that takes time to build up. Yeah. And well, so the airline industry is actually a very interesting one because it, uh, it overall isn't a particularly profitable industry. Yes, it is a very, very expensive industry because you have to have all of that infrastructure. And I'm talking about the physical aircraft themselves and the staff and the airports. And it's also based on one of the most volatile uh, commodities that there is, as you said earlier, oil is if the oil price goes up 20%, that has a very big impact on the price of, of plane tickets. It, it has to. But also it's, it is fundamental for us to have this interconnected globe now more than, more than ever. And it's why we see companies, uh, airliners, regularly get bailed out by their respective governments because the government can't afford for there not to be an airline in that country and operating within that country because it is fundamental to the economy to actually have that interconnectedness, that physical mm. interconnectedness, not just, not just digital. But one of the things that I learned recently is that the airline, and I'm talking specifically about American airlines at the moment, but this applies to this applies to international ones as well. I'm just not too sure of the exact numbers. So like your your Deltas and your American Airlines and stuff, they're they are incorporated separately from their rewards program, right? And their rewards program, also known as like frequent flyer miles or just miles, is actually more significantly more profitable than the airlines themselves because as we established there's a very thin profit margin especially considering all the competition but what the airlines have done is they have created a currency that is redeemable for flying for flights because everyone wants flights right that they then sell to their partners like banks and credit cards and stuff like that and so they've created this digital currency that they sell that, that they are also the central bank for, and they can just print this currency and distribute it. Now, let's take, for instance, you are a bank and you have, you know, a thousand people who operate from your bank and you reward each of them for using your services with these frequent flyer miles. Very few of those people are ever going to accumulate enough miles to really take advantage of that system, right? But you've already purchased those, those miles from the airline. So the airline is essentially selling this currency that is only redeemable for airline for flights that most of them aren't actually cashed in on, right? So it's such a, such a good business to complement what is a sense, uh, essentially such an unprofitable business. So they've just found like another route to monetization. Yeah. So I, I definitely feel like I've been sort of indoctrinated into the Avio's points way of, of looking at things because I, I, I've also like, because I do so many trips down to Cape Town, actually like on a tangent, there, there's actually now Virgin that does like direct to Cape Town too. Which also also speaks to what you were saying about the diversity of airlines that are actually going to directly go to to Cape Town. 
But what I thought is like during the pandemic, I thought I'll be going to Cape Town quite a lot. The flight from London to Cape Town is like a fairly like no brainer to take. So I thought, okay, I'll try and accumulate these points so that I can use it for a discount on, on the airline. Like when I, whenever I go home, the problem is that it, it's so freaking hard to like actually accumulate those points. It, it kind of feels a little bit like scammy in a sense because you kind of always like accumulating these points and you only get like okay you get like 70 pounds off a of flight if you're using avios points to, as a discount but it's not like 100 pounds it's not like 500 pounds and then you've got these these websites where you go on and it tells you like what is the best way to accumulate points so apparently the best way is not to go on long flights but to go on lots of short flights because you still earn the same amount of points well, relatively the same amount of points, but you you just have to take shorter flights. And that changes from from airline to airline is that they they have a bunch of really good analysts who are sitting there trying to make sure that people don't game the system. Then you've got a whole bunch of yeah. subreddits that are sitting there actively trying to game the system. And so there's like this arms race between the the gamers and the analysts. Yes, but but my theory about airline miles is that it only and this is partly why I took, I took like a premium economy is because I think that once you get to the next level up, I think in the basic level, the lowest level, it's very hard to accumulate points. But you know, that thing in life, you know, as you get more wealthy, you tend to get more things. Mm -hmm. What I've noticed is that the amount of points you get for a traveling business class and for traveling like premium economy and traveling first class means that you also accumulate points a lot, a lot faster. So. What I think is that once you start to take a few like business class flights, you first of all, you're, you're paying for those flights, which are more expensive. So your credit card can also act as a way of accumulating more points and you actually get rewarded more for taking a more expensive flight. So I think once you get to a certain uh, level where you're taking business class all the time, I think you accumulate points way faster, almost to a point where it's actually worthwhile having yeah. them. That makes but then sense. Anything below that, like if you're just flying economy, because even with economy, like you can't even upgrade using points, right? Because they, they're like, oh no, you can only upgrade if you premium economy. So it's really like this kind of false incentive. And as you say, maybe it is because people want you to just, it's just like a loyalty card, right? You just want them to keep on coming. But I think, I, I don't know if I'll ever be able at, at that point, will I actually be able to test it out? But I've got the sneaking suspicion that once you start to, you know, fly first class all the time, you probably get quite a few like free class, like free flights and free holidays. And it, I mean, I've seen, like, I've seen itself. the price of those first class tickets and I'm like, shit, if you are flying first class all the time, then it doesn't actually matter. So they're like happy to give you those things because, you know, you'll like go on to first class and then you'll also order a really expensive bottle of champagne and that'll completely negate all the points you've. It's, All the it's, points you've it's so made. like it's so wild how much money you actually need to have to to get to that that point because i take i take like flying as a fairly like large expense in my life right like if i need to fly to cape town it, it is fairly expensive and a and percentage of my you know monthly take-home salary it's it's quite a lot but you think about that in terms of like people who have flying private or flying like you know first class all the time and they're taking their family too so it's like not just one ticket it's like four tickets i'm just like whoa you must be like like mega wealthy yeah and then you just like as you said throwing in the champagne and you're like oh i'll have the caviar at the airport and actually speaking of airports the other thing that i noticed because i've been flying a lot in the last couple of months is there's actually so many fancy like if you go into an airport, there's like designer clothing stores. There's like really expensive Rolex watches. There's perfumes. like all the they love selling perfumes. Perfumes, but I'm like, who's buying all this stuff, right? So I, I was thinking about it, and my this is another maybe a conspiracy or maybe like my own theory. It's actually a way that you can convert money between different currencies in a much more effective way than using a foreign exchange, because if you're wealthy. And you want to get money from like London to India, or you want to get from London to another country. What you can do is you can go to the airport, you can take your money, you can buy something really expensive, 
go like something expensive with like a certain design of value, go to your country, you just carry it under your arm. And then you get to the, get to the country where you're going and just sell it on the other side and you get your cash back. So I think that the, the, those expensive clothing stores are actually just a way that people can convert their money or get money out of the country without having to carry physical cash. That's an interesting theory. I, I personally think it's more of like, it's similar to free to play video games is that they, they operate on the, on the whale principle where most of the players, or in this case, most of the flyers don't actually make them any money, but like 1% of flyers just come through and buy, you know, some Gucci stuff as well as the fancy champagne and caviar. And in so doing, they actually still remain profitable because they have the whales that come through. I think so. They could be that. But like, if you're earning, if you've got that much money, like, 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 I'm just trying to get into that mindset of like, you know, you know, when I go to an airport, I get there, I'm like, okay, maybe I'll go to the sweet shop, get, get a little small bag of sweets or nuts or chocolates. I'll go into like the, the boots or the clicks and I'll just like get like, you know, a couple of, you know, tissues or something. And that's like, maybe I'll get like a stereo stumpy or something that I'll have in the airport. So those are kind of like small items that I just like buy at the airport. Are these wealthy people going in and like, oh, I'm just going to like just buy a Rolex, you know, while I'm here. It's, it seems like it's on sale. That is actually um, fairly interesting. And it's also like a pretty good way to, I don't want to say launder money, but like if you go to a new country, you always have to declare if you have over X amount of cash, right? So if you have $10,000 in cash, you have to declare that. So it could be that you are visiting South Africa to make some off the books mining money. Right? And then you yes. get to the airport and you've got $10,000 in cash. What you do is you go and you buy yourself a Rolex and some Gucci, some Gucci or a Gucci handbag. And what you have over there is now ostensibly $10,000 worth of product. Yeah, that makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Because you don't don't have to, you don't have to declare your Rolex when you go to, to the new country, but you do have to declare the cash. Yeah. I also thought it was something to do with money laundering, but it's just like, it doesn't make sense because if you're wealthy enough, why? And you in London, like you can go to like Harrods or you can go down to like Oxford Street and you can go to like a really nice Rolex place and get like a really nice experience. Like, why are you going to the airport to go get a personal shopper? Because in in Heathrow, the, the Terminal Five, they're like, oh yeah, there's upstairs you can go and have your personal shopper. Who's getting a personal shopper in the right. airport, man? Like so, that that sounds so like sad. <laughs> so let's, let's change let's change tracks a bit over here. Traveling between Johannesburg and Cape Town in South Africa, or just local flights in general, we've we've kind of touched on them before in our in our episode about trains and how dope trains are. But it, it takes two hours to fly from here to to Johannesburg, and it's actually a fairly hassle free flight. Like I can I get to the airport, take an Uber to the airport in half an hour, and then my brother or I hop on the south train from the airport in Johannesburg. And that's a, let's say, overall three-hour experience, which is pretty, pretty good. And then there's also something to be said about how efficient and cheap flights are comparatively. So the, the thesis goes something like this, is that if you have a brand new set, like let's take, for instance, we go and we start a new town somewhere in South Africa that isn't connected to any of the rail infrastructure, right? It is really difficult to connect it to the rail infrastructure because you have to get all the land between there and the closest rail point and you have to construct that infrastructure. However, building an airport, you just need a plot of land that you can put down one kilometer worth of worth of asphalt on. And boom, now it's connected to the 10,000 airports that are in the country. So it's actually like a really, really efficient way to build infrastructure. And if we don't take carbon emissions into account, and we can talk about that in terms of like what the future of, say, biofuels holds for that, because there's no real way to electrify flights just yet. But if we if we don't necessarily take that into account, it is arguably 
the cheapest way to get around as well, because the infrastructure necessary to get from point A to point B is so, is so simple. Mm. Yeah. The, one of the things that I, that struck me recently about like inter-country travel is I think in France, they've actually like banned because they've got such a good rail network, they've banned flights within France itself, obviously for, for carbon emissions places. But I think we've done the math before, I think on the show that it's going to take, it would take too long to get a train from Cape Town to Johannesburg. But I do think of like a future where, you know, maybe South Africa is more populated in areas that maybe aren't as populated now. And airports are ex like usually the most efficient ways to get places other than like a helicopter, right? Because if you had like helipads where, wherever you could kind of, and you had enough money, you could probably do a, you know, vertical takeoff and landing kind of systems. And you wouldn't have to even have a strip of land to have a runway, right? You could just like sort of take off wherever. But I do envision this kind of future where, you know, flights being a little bit more, it would have to be a little bit more efficient in terms of like the emissions. But what really impresses me when I go through Cape Town, especially on the, on the departure side, is that you can actually get pretty much anywhere relatively easy from, from Cape Town itself, right? Because like they've got like a direct flight to Washington. They've got like a direct flight to Newark in New Jersey. I think there was even one to, is it like not, not Austin, but somewhere, somewhere in America, Dallas. No, there's Atlanta, Atlanta. Yeah. So, so, so they've even got like flights to Atlanta and those kind of things, which I think it's pretty long haul. I've actually done the Cape town to Newark, which, which is pretty hectic flight, but it, it, it does give you at least, mm -hmm. you know, one hop to there and then another hop to San Francisco. And another hop to Austin or another hop to potentially, you know, Seattle or wherever. You can also get to London directly. There's actually now two carriers that do that. You can, I mean, via Johannesburg, you can actually get to Sydney. I, I don't know if Qantas has reopened that flight, but that interconnectivity on a global scale is actually really good to know because if you like, you know, an up, up and coming, like entrepreneur and you want to start doing business with the United States of America, then it's quite handy to be able to just jump on one flight and, you know, no matter what class, you know, get to that, that country and be able to, you know, do a little bit of business in a more sort of South African way, which I think is quite, quite interesting and quite exciting about just travel in general and seeing some of the trends in terms of like the number of routes that have been open for everyone in South Africa. And not just that is the, the distance that we can travel on some of the newer planes. So during the pandemic, and I forget which countries this, this was exactly, but because they couldn't make the stop in the, in the layover point that they would generally have it in, they actually just created a plane that could fly over it all the way to their destinations. I, I think it's something like Singapore to somewhere in the States. So it's like a. A 16 hour flight in one stretch, you just go boop, there to there, longest flight in the world. And we can, we can theoretically, if we had those planes everywhere, get anywhere on the globe from anywhere, assuming that there was, there was a, an airstrip on both sides, which is pretty incredible. Herman, and I've had the best idea. So some like taking some of what we talked about in our last episode. Like, what about a future where instead of just having this little shitty screen that you have to watch like old movies on, you actually had like a, a VR headset. And so while you're flying, you're actually like sitting in a nice, like, you know, oasis village <laughs> or you're sitting this sounds somewhere. So cyberpunk is like, it, <laughs> you just see like a whole bunch of people and you're in like a shitty, you know, it's like the London underground and everything is rattling and dingy. Yeah. And there's like but, a rat scurrying in the <laughs> corner, but everyone's on their headsets and they're just like chilling out on the beach or like hanging out. <laughs> this is what yeah. the metaverse was designed for. Maybe like, I think it, like, imagine it's just like a you know, first class emulator. So instead of actually being in first class, you just feel like you are. You get your, but, uh, but in coach, they just give you like a shittier emulator. 
Yeah, they could, but, but, or, or yeah, it would just be like a really like cardboard, like very plasticky kind of one that's like is half broken and it has a weird plug where you only hear the sound on one side. But it, yeah, like, yeah, I think because on those sort of longer haul flights, right, there's obviously the question of like, what do you do for 16 hours of, of your day? Because like even sleeping, like you can't really, I mean, you can sleep for like eight hours max if you've got like a couple of sleeping pills because like, it's, I find it almost impossible to sleep for more than like three or four hours at, in any one stint. But if you have to like now, you know, do that and be awake for like a, a full day, I would say you need to have like a lot of stuff to do. And also in terms of like being able to walk about. So maybe even you could take like a really like these double decker planes and you could kind of have the top floor, which is just like an in- entertainment area. We have lots of people doing VR stuff and then downstairs where you're actually sitting at your your sitting at your seat you can actually use like your ar glasses to kind of interact with this really cool world and hopefully spend the time a little bit quicker yeah yeah so on on that note there was i forget what the airline was but it was one of those low-cost carriers like ryanair or something like that where there was a, a whole bunch of outrage around their proposal to potentially have like standing the standing economy. Yeah. My, my, bro- my brother's adamant that they're going to bring that in at, at some point in the near future. Of, like if, if regulation allows it, of course they're going to bring it in because while we as humans rarely like to complain about, about economy, like about economy class, is economy class is so aligned with the cost of the service itself, right? And people will regularly like pretty much everyone who isn't fairly wealthy will try and find the cheapest flight. And if that means that you're going to be standing for that flight is the market will validate this idea 100%, right? Is like, if you can fly to Joburg from Cape Town for, you know, 300 Rand instead of 600 Rand, uh, but you have to stand for two hours, people are 100% going to do that. And like, sure, they'll complain bitterly about it, but they got to Joburg for 300 rand. And I think that this is, this is the whole, this is the whole sort of mentality that we've been talking about for this entire episode is that like, yes, it sucks to sit on a plane for 12 hours to get from Cape Town to London, but it is significantly better than the alternative and 100% worth it is there's there's no other options you're 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 paying a reasonably inexpensive amount for what it is that you're getting and it's just not particularly comfortable